When most people talk about PAL world, they usually describe it as Pokemon, but with guns. But if you go in expecting an open world Pokemon experience, you'll probably be disappointed. PAL world really is just a pretty standard survival game where you occasionally capture a penguin and make him craft stuff for you. In reality, these two games could not be more different. Pokemon is a game about the harmony between humans and nature, and working with your Pokemon to become stronger together. And Pow World is all about the benefits of the unrelenting capitalist machine. So in keeping with the spirits of this game, let's reduce all these living, breathing creatures down to numbers on a spreadsheet to find out which Pow World Pow is statistically the best. Richard, hit that intro. Though I'm far from the first to try to rank every pal by strength, this video might be a little different from the ones you're used to. I'm going to try to rank all these pals based solely on numerical data available in the games. There will be no personal bias of mine, no subjective picks, just pure statistics, as any true capitalist likes it. To do this, we're going to be using a statistical model called a decision matrix. For those of you who are new to the channel and haven't seen me use this before, a decision matrix is a method used in science and engineering to objectively rank things based on a number of criteria. It comes in three simple steps. First, you select the criteria that you want to judge everything on. Then you standardize those criteria to make them easier to compare. And lastly, you weight each criteria in order from most important to least important. It sounds complicated, but when all is said and done, we should have a simple score out of 10 possible points for every single pal in the game. Whichever one has the highest score is statistically the strongest pal. In Pal World, your pals can do two things. They can help you in battle, or they can work at your base. Today, we're only going to be looking at the pals battle prowess. Having a good base is less about having one really good pal that can do everything, and more about a good balance of highly specialized pals. Who knows, maybe in the future I'll talk about the best base configuration or something, but for today, we are only concerned with how good a pal is at murdering its fellow creatures. Also, as a caveat, at the time of writing, this game is still in early access, so there are a lot of bugs and exploits that make certain pals extremely broken. I'm assuming that these bugs will eventually be patched out of the game's full release, so in the interest of not having this video become immediately outdated, we're not going to talk about any of those today, so sorry to all you sweepa stands. With that in mind, the first step of the decision matrix process is to select all the criteria that we want to judge the pals on. Now these have to be expressible with numbers. So as an easy first example, base stats. Every pal has three stats, attack, defense, and HP that are all easily available on the internet. So I can just grab those, pop them in a spreadsheet and make those our first three criteria. And luckily, all the other criteria will be just as easy to obtain. Just kidding, idiot. The next two criteria have to do with elements. Pal World has eight different elements that are totally legally distinct from Pokemon's types. I mean, look, our early rodents are neutral type, not normal. I mean, it's a totally different thing. A pal's element determines two things, the types of attacks that it's weak to and the types of attacks that it can use for boosted damage. I'm sure you're all familiar with the trans-dimensional hypercube that is Pokemon's complicated web of type interactions that I still have trouble remembering after playing these games for 15 years. Pal World takes a much simpler approach and their type chart looks like this. 
Every element is strong against one other element, with the exception of fire that's strong against both ice and grass, and neutral that's strong against nothing. To find an element's resistances, it's pretty easy. You can just reverse the chart. Every element resists whatever element it's strong against, along with itself, with the exception of neutral, which does not resist itself. So from this, we can easily fill in all the resistances and weaknesses for every pal, including the 24 dual-typed pals, and take the sum to find a resistance score. According to most online articles about this game, super effective attacks deal twice as much damage, while resisted attacks deal half as much. So just like Pokemon, nice and simple. <laughs> So it turns out most of the major news outlets releasing their little guides on this game didn't do their research because this is not true. If you look at the in-game numbers, it turns out that super effective attacks deal only 1.5 times as much damage, while resisted attacks deal 0.75 times as much. I did a whole bunch of testing in-game myself to verify this, and you can test it out yourself with a rideable pal. But just goes to show, you can't trust everything you read on the internet, kids. So take that, GameSpot! You just got scienced! Ah, but the math whizzes among you may have noticed something interesting. In this game, the damage buff for super effective hits is more than the damage reduction for resisted hits. So what then would happen with dual-typed pals? A pal like Pengullet is a water and ice type. So what would happen if you used a fire type attack on it? Ice is weak to fire, meaning it should take 150% damage, but water resists fire, meaning it would also take 75% damage. These two don't perfectly cancel each other out, like with most other RPGs, so that would mean that Pengullet would actually take 1.125 times as much damage from fire attacks, effectively making it one-third weak to fire. Seeing as the internet is not to be trusted on this matter, I took to the game myself and got my answer the good old-fashioned way. By burning scores and scores of innocent penguins to death. And I'm happy to report that, no. The game is programmed in such a way to not allow these partial weaknesses. It's hard programmed so that the small handful of pals that have type combinations that would allow for an interaction like this just take neutral damage. Was this way too much work just to ensure that I didn't accidentally knock Pengullet down a tenth of a point in the final score? Probably, but I am committed to giving every pal, even the humble Pengullet, the fairest of shakes that I can. Even if I have to murder hundreds of thousands of its kind to do it. So, long story short, I added another section to the spreadsheet with every pal's type interactions. It's important to note here that because of the way the game's type interactions work, having many weaknesses is worse than having less resistances, since resistances don't negate as much damage. Then I simply added all these multipliers together for every pal to get a final resistance score, with a lower number meaning that a pal has more resistances than weaknesses. Luckily, quantifying a type's offensive prowess is a lot easier. In this game, every pal can learn basically any attack in the game, regardless of its element. But if a pal uses an attack that's the same element as it, then it will get a 1.2 times boost to damage. So you're incentivized to use at least some attacks that are the same type as your pal. So to determine a pal's offensive prowess, I simply looked at how many other pals it could hit super effective with its stab types. Unsurprisingly, the best offensive type is fire because it's strong against two different types, followed by dragon, which is strong against the game's abundance of dark types. Water and dark are also pretty good here. Neutral is obviously the worst because it's not super effective against anything, followed by Grass, which is able to hit a whopping 9 pals. 
for super effective damage. Huge. On the subject of attacks, I mentioned that every pal can learn basically any attack in the game. There are a handful of attacks, however, that are exclusive to certain pals. These exclusive attacks range from pretty good to really good, but the problem is it's pretty much impossible to quantify their effectiveness in an unbiased way for this spreadsheet. Because you have to consider more than just raw damage. Every move has different charge times, areas of effect, ranges, extra bonuses, a bunch of stuff. One move might be really good at dealing big damage to a single foe, while the another is best for clearing groups. So it's really hard to say which move is objectively better than another, because they're all tools for specific scenarios. But in general, these exclusive attacks are usually a little stronger than their similar non-exclusive counterparts. So for this criteria, we're going to keep it pretty simple. If a pal has access to an exclusive move, it gets a bonus point. Is this the best solution? No, but as of now, it's the most unbiased one I've got. But if enough people like this video and want to see more PAL World stuff, who knows? Maybe I'll make a follow-up where I rank all these attacks, and then we can revisit this. That sounds... Well, actually, no, that sounds terrible. That sounds like way too much work. To bang out another quick criteria, this one is incredibly niche, but I just know that some people are gonna start yelling at me if I don't include it. There are two pals that can only be obtained by breeding other pals. Elfredrin Aqua and Frostalian Noct. These two pals specifically cannot spawn anywhere in the wild. This means that these are the only two pals in the game that you cannot possibly get alpha versions of. Those are those big shiny guys. The reason this matters is because an alpha Pokemon has much higher health than a regular one. So as niche as it may be, technically speaking, these two Pokemon... What? Bro, what are you talking about, man? ...have a lower power ceiling than other pals of the same ilk, and they must be punished accordingly. And lastly, we get to possibly the most complicated criteria that I've been putting off, the partner skills. This is sort of Pal World's equivalent to Pokemon's abilities, except every single Pal has their own unique one. And as much as I want to, I can't just simply ignore these either, because some of these skills are complete game changers, and others do basically nothing. They can have all sorts of effects from boosting certain damage types to adding additional attack options to sometimes dropping cotton candy when assigned to the ranch. Completely busted that one. In order to keep these rankings completely objective, I've created a rubric to judge all these partner skills based on five features that makes a skill useful in combat specifically. Each skill will get a check mark for each one of these features that it has, and the number of check marks that it has at the end will become the final score for that skill. The first feature is type modifiers. There are a lot of skills that change your character's attacks to be a certain type, which is good because it can allow you to hit things super effectively. After that is damage boosts. Some skills can boost the power of certain types, while others can enhance your attacks, things of that nature. Third, certain skills can give a pal access to an extra type of attack, like how you can activate Pangullet's special ability to fire it out of a rocket launcher to engulf your foes in fiery explosions. I know this may seem inhumane to use a penguin as live ammunition, but I mean, I gave it a check mark, I mean, what else do you want from me? Now get in that rocket launcher! Next is defensive boosts. These are rarer, but there are some abilities that can increase your defense, heal you, give you a regen effect, stuff like that. And lastly, any ability that can allow a pal to be ridden gets a check mark. This may seem strange, riding seems more like an exploration buff than a combat one, but the ability to ride a pal actually gives you a major advantage in battles when it comes to move cooldowns. 
moves. Because this is an action game, you have to wait for your moves to charge up before you can use them. And the more powerful the move, the longer its charge usually is. Pals usually act on their own, just using their moves as they charge up. But if you are riding a pal, then you can control when it uses its moves. And the game actually has two different charge times for moves. One for when the pal is acting on its own, and another for when you're riding it. This means that a pal can use a really strong attack on its own. Then you can hop on it and immediately use that really strong attack again, effectively doubling its damage output. Riding a pal also gives you control over its movement so you can help it dodge enemy attacks and get it into better positions. So long story short, riding a pal is real good. So now all I have to do is go through all 137 partner skills in the game and grade each one based on our five point rubric. Oh boy. Many unbearable hours later. Well, that sucked, but we're finally done and we're ready to move on to step two of three. Don't worry, these next two steps are super quick. Step two is to standardize everything to make it on a scale from one to 10 to make everything easier to compare. This one is pretty straightforward. The only thing we need to be careful of is the resistance score. For that one, a lower score meant better resistances, whereas for everything else, a higher score was better. So we need to use this formula here to flip that scale before scaling it down to be from 1 to 10. Once all that's done, the next step is to select weights. A weight is a percentage that measures how important each criteria is. This lets you control which criteria you want to focus on and prevents any less important factors from skewing your data. After doing some research on competitive Power World battling forums, yes, those exist, I found that in general, people find attack to be the most important factor, weighted at 18%, followed closely by HP, defense, and partner skills at 15% each. After that is type matchup offenses. It's helpful if you can have it, but because you can easily get any coverage move you want on any pal, it's not as crucial. Then we have resistances. Again, they're pretty good, but it's also pretty easy to just not send out a pal against an element it's weak to. And then rounding out the bottom, we have alpha potential and exclusive skills at the lowest, since our method for ranking them wasn't the most well-defined and I don't want it to skew the data too much. Now the final step is to multiply each standardized score by its respective weight and then take the sum of all of those for each pal and we'll have a final score out of 10 possible points. Whichever pal has the highest score is statistically the best pal in the game. I don't have time to go over all 137 pals rankings, so I went ahead and included a link to this whole spreadsheet that I used in the making of this video, complete with all sorts of stats on every pal and their skills, their final scores, all of that in the description down below so you can take a peek for yourself. But before I reveal the final answer, just for fun, let's scroll all the way down to the bottom of this list. Since this method ranks every single pal, we can find not only the best, but also the worst. And it turns out the statistically worst pal in the game is... Swee! It's tied with Chicopee for the lowest base stat total in the game. Its ice type is fine, I guess. And heck, even Chicopee got a special move. Honestly, Swee's got nothing going for it. Again, apologies to all the infinite power sweep of stands out there, but you're on a ticking clock here. Once that bug is patched, this thing's going straight in the garbage. If we take a look at the types section, we can find that dragon and fire is undisputedly the best typing in the game. It's tied with fire and ground for the best resistance score of any type combo, and it's able to hit a whopping 61 pals for super effective stab damage. That's almost half the pals in the game. If you just get a water type coverage move on there, suddenly you're hitting two out of every three pals that you come across 
for super effective damage. This fact catapults Jormantide Ignit all the way to number two on this list, combined with his ability that doubles the power of all fire type attacks when you ride it. Safe to say, yeah, Red Gyarados here is easily murdering some people. But he's not the most powerful pal in the game. No, for that distinction, I'm afraid there's one little factor that I have hid from you this whole time. See, in this game, there is one creature that is more powerful, more destructive than any other pal in existence. One that can win and has won every single battle it has engaged in. And evolutionarily speaking, what is the difference between a pal and a human? Sure, it may be considered taboo. It's not, strictly speaking, legal. But those pal spheres you've been crafting can work on any creature in pal world. And it turns out that humans, with their superior intellect and devastating firearms, can easily best any pal- What? They suck? Yeah, all right, so it turns out that while you can catch any of the human characters in the game, none of them are really worth it at all. You could catch the strongest dude with the biggest gun, but I guess something about being in a pal sphere makes you forget everything you knew about technology, because even though they clearly still have the gun in their hand, all any human character can ever do is use the move punch. Though it is a punch with conviction, I must say. They do have that going for them. But nothing else. That's it. That, they really suck. But I believe I've kept you all waiting for long enough. It's time to reveal the answer. The single strongest pal in all of Pal World is, drumroll please. Really? Really, Richard? That's the best you got? God, I, I hate I ought to stick you in a rocket launcher, but we'll make do. The strongest pal in all of Pow World is the legendary Frostallion. Being one of four legendary pals of Pow World, it has among the highest base stat total in the game. Its ice typing is fair from an offensive and defensive perspective, but it's able to hit all of the powerful dragon pals super effectively. And unlike its counterpart, Frostallion Noct, it has the potential to be an alpha Pokemon. But the real thing that puts Frostallion heads and shoulders above the rest is its partner skill, Ice Steed. Not only can it be mounted, but it also changes your attacks to be ice and it boosts the power of all ice type attacks when you mount it. An ability that allowed you to do just one of these things would be pretty good. All three in one is absolutely insane. So there you have it. The strongest pal in the game is statistically the legendary Frostallion. If you enjoyed the video and you want to see more like it, I have a bunch of videos on my channel doing similar stuff to this, and I have new videos out every Saturday. If you want to see more Power World content in the future, let me know by hitting that subscribe button. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have a small penguin to launch out of a small tube at Mach 2. Come here, Richard Jr., I'm gonna get you! A huge thanks to all my patrons, including Alakazam, Ethan Furlano, Sherry and Mark, Starjoy, Big Dog Tie for to Win, The Boss Killer 94, Alberung Freud and Celicate, and Sir Hammy. 